Ameni. If you have your Bibles, let's go to Romans chapter number 8. Romans 8. We're going to read verse 1 to 11. You there already? It says here, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life or the law of the spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live according to the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God, does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of, the, because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal body because of his Spirit who lives in you. Sounds like a long rhyme, eh? But Father, we just want to thank you for this word in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, I could just greet somebody. Good morning. Are you blessed? Only a few weeks left before winter is over. And from next week, ladies, while you're going to go through that door, we want to scan you just to make sure it's you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we just want to thank the Lord for another day uh, in the presence of his word. And we also want to thank the Lord for all of those who made it to church today. And uh, we know you put some effort. Waking up at around, some of you, you had to be up at around five or so. And uh, it was not easy, we know very well. But we just want to thank the Lord nonetheless for it. You made it and God bless you. And uh, may, may it be worth your, your effort, everything. It lets us know today. Import a myosi. Osa pancha. Osa myosi. Amen. Yeah. Uh, we continue with our lesson. Uh, about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. And what I would like to highlight today is the spirit of life. As we go on, we'll be just uh, showing you how he works, what he stands for. And uh, I think after we have done this part, yeah, explaining the three parts of man, it is very important to understand it. It is very important for us to go through it because then it's going to be able to help you to understand the work of the Holy Spirit. For he works 
in the whole man. It's going to actually help you with regards to the Holy Spirit and the, your body, the Holy Spirit and the spirit, the, the spirit part of you, which is the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit and the soulish part of you, which is you. It helps to understand first the man himself. Then you will understand a number of things as to how you are able to yield yourself to, to the Holy Spirit and uh, ask for, for help with regards to many things that, uh, that you go through. Amen. So, what I want us to do today is to look at where we left off last week. Two things, in, 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 uh, basically two things. What happens at death? That'll be the first question we answer. Then the second question we answer would be, how big is the human soul? This will help you to, to be able to understand the work of the Holy Spirit. Again, we, we spoke last week briefly. We, went, we couldn't finish about uh, um, what happens at death as to... Where does the man who God built in the Garden of Eden, who he created, when he dies, what happens to him? We'll answer that. Then we will try to answer this one as well. important. How big or how, what's the size, what's the actual size? Or give an idea of the size of the human soul. How big is a person? That will also help you to understand in the future when we begin to speak about the spiritual realm and how the Holy Spirit begins to minister to a person. It, it, it helps you to understand some of these things because some people have got, uh, you know, but they have, they, they have or the people who go like, my, my soul is heavily laden or I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm heavily laden with pain and sorrow. I'm not happy. I wish I could just drop dead and die. So when somebody says, I don't know what happened to me, but I just woke up and I don't feel like living anymore. You begin to understand those things better and how to yield to the Holy Spirit. You begin to understand things on how to deal with depression, how to, to, to deal with uh, uh, so many things that weigh you down. How, well, where does worry reside in man? Excite, excitement, idulamu, parting a finger mutu. That helps you a lot when you understand yourself. Then you understand how the Holy Spirit will be a constant help in times of need. Are you okay with that? So the, the, the portion that we have just read now, which sounds like a huge rhyme, which keeps going around spirit, life, flesh, and then everything else. The part I wanted to highlight was verse number 11. But then I, want, I have highlighted a number of things. We're concentrating on verse 11, but I have highlighted a number of things from verse 1 uh, that I have actually wanted to, to indicate to you. The very one is uh, in verse number 2, where it says, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. Now, here we see another name of the Holy Spirit highlighted as the spirit of what? As the spirit of? The spirit of life. Which means when the Holy Spirit came into the person's life, into a place, into Adam for the first time, he brought life. So where the life is, there is something that we call living life, in the spirit, or living in the spirit, or being aware of the spiritual realm, or realizing that uh, for so many things that weigh you down, which make you feel lifeless. You know, have you, have you seen, or have you been in a position where you're walking around, but you wouldn't really care even if you got knocked down by a car because you feel it's not worth it. So that is 
what the Holy Spirit stands for, the opposite of that. It is what the Holy Spirit stands for, what he can do, bring that kind of revival in a person's life. Now, one other thing, the Holy Spirit does not become active uh, because you go to church. You know that he becomes active because you are aware of him. Okay, like inside a room where people have been locking themselves in the whole day, especially when it's winter like this and people are sitting in a small room and they're excited and you come in there and the first thing you, you smell, and they're just happy, they're drinking coffee, they don't even actually worry, you smell socks, you smell carbon monoxide. And people are not worried about it. Because you come there and you're becoming aware. So they are sitting there, but they're not aware because they are just not taking out for that. They are minding their own business. But when I would learn, the first thing you pick up is these people are sitting there and you run for the windows and you go, how can you sit? Then you start throwing the windows open. And people are going to think, you know, but really you're out of order. So the Holy Spirit doesn't work in a person's life simply because they're a Christian. There are many Christians who do not even believe in the ministry of the Holy Spirit for starters. Now, will a person go to hell because they don't believe in the Holy Spirit? The answer is no. But truly, the, a person will miss that complete life in Christ without being aware of the Holy Spirit. The absence of the Holy Spirit will give an unfulfilled life on earth. You will go to heaven. Finally, a lot of people who don't believe in the Holy Spirit, who don't actually... They just know him as God, the Holy Spirit, but they don't actually receive the Holy Spirit, the baptism, uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. They don't believe in the Holy Spirit as a helper. They don't believe in the Holy Spirit as, as anything. You will still go to heaven, but you'll be missing out on a lot while you are on earth. So, he is the spirit of life. Then we have a Moho verse number, number four, where it says, those who live according to the flesh. It speaks about the flesh. And those who live according to the flesh, but who, do not, who do not live according to the flesh, but who live according to the spirit. Now that tells you there is work that the Holy Spirit does in the body of a person. You know, that the Holy Spirit has impact, has a ministry that he ministers to your flesh. When you have issues with flesh issues, you get that? The flesh stands for many things. It could stand for uh, immorality, it stands for gluttony is part of the works of the flesh. Hatred is part of the works of the flesh. To are a Christian, when we go like, oh, you know, oh, he's in the flesh. What do we mean? Or they are just working. They are no longer like even aware of the means of the Holy Spirit. Or they have shut him out altogether. How he is 100% in the flesh. Who is a Christian, but he's heading the other way. Do you get the point? So, the Holy Spirit helps us also with this body, on how to keep this body under check, how to ensure that we, when people look at us, they can reconcile us to God by looking at how we live. The acts of the flesh. Things that would that, that sell you out to people. How about how oh, you say he goes to church, but look at what he's doing or what, what she's doing. The Holy Spirit helps you to come out of that situation, to be able to harness the flesh, to, 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 to beat it down. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives the ability to beat the body down and, and, and make it subject to God's laws. So and then Moho verse number 6, where it says the mind governed by the flesh. Next to it, if you want to write something, something, you could write the soul that is governed by the flesh. The mind is the soulish part. Because we said to you last week, with the, with the soul we contact, we contact this intellectual realm. It is the soul that, that has a degree. Unangliwana. the soul. Let's call him PhD. It's the soul that's, that keeps failing metric. And if you understand how the ministry of the Holy Spirit with regards to the mind or the flesh, you'd remember this one thing. That, that's why Jesus said, when I go, the Spirit will come and he will remind you of all things. Remind. 
He'll put into your mind again what I said, which you heard. Things I said to you and you received and you tend to forget them somehow because then forgetfulness and stupidity is the work of the devil. So you have to chase out the spirit, such stupidity, out of the kid and lay hands and speak and, 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 and he open the kid up to the spirit of wisdom. Not the spirit of intelligence, but the spirit of wisdom because wisdom is superior. Intelligence is what you get, got last room, but wisdom is what comes from the Holy Spirit. In the book of Ecclesiastes, it speaks about um, a, a city which was besieged by enemies. And here there lived a poor man in that city, but he was wise. It is through his wisdom, he was able to save the whole city, but he was not remembered because he was poor. So this man, was, this man had wisdom, but now this is where you find people channeling all their wisdom into only one area, and forgetting the other areas. Though, When the spirit of wisdom comes through, he does not only help your mind to function better, he is going to create what God said in the life of Solomon. You ask for wisdom, but what's the point of me giving you wisdom without giving you wealth so you could manage wealth through wisdom? So where there's wisdom, there's rulership, and there is wealth. So wisdom does not only make you pass metric, it also makes you to be able to accumulate wealth and manage it according to God's way. So that's the spirit of wisdom. And that is why, Ushabe this out, in them. people who don't actually give, they do not even have the necessary wisdom to manage the little that they are holding. And check this out. As soon as a person begins to give, they get open to ideas. And I'm not saying this because I want anything from you. I could have done that last week. But I'm just simply saying this one thing. God says to Solomon, what is it that you need? Solomon says wisdom. Then God says, with that, I will give you wealth and everything else. So wisdom is the ability to manage more than yourself, to manage things around you. You take, you take a parent who is sharing uh, the assets among his children. If the parent has got five kids and they gave them 20,000 20, rands each, if the parent has only 100,000, gives them 20, 20, 20, 20, uh, you knock on, the, on their doors six months down the line or 12 months down the line. Some of those parents would be back to square one without a cent in their pocket. But one of them would have actually multiplied it. They would have 21,000 runs. What, what causes that? Spirit of wisdom. It is the spirit of wisdom that teaches a man not to, to break his family. That teaches a woman not to break his family. That teaches children not to break up their parents' uh, peace. Get the spirit of wisdom. So when you find yourself troublesome, you need wisdom. When you are sitting there and you don't know what to do, you need wisdom. And this is, that's why you need to find, identify wise people around you. Not intelligent people, wise people. I'll, 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 I'll show you how intelligence does not necessarily translate to wise. Take a professor, what a varsity, and take a standard two preacher. The standard two preacher can change the mind of a professor. The professor can call a standard two teacher, what 18, papa. And the, 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 the preacher can call the professor, my son. When there's an age difference at 30, 30 years, when the man is elder than himself, that's what I say. I, I, it, it doesn't require intelligence. It requires wisdom to notice that there is deception. So you can never detect deception through intelligence. But deception is detected through wisdom. And that is why one day they brought um, two women came to Solomon. Remember the story? One had a dead baby. Then she woke up and she found her no one a Then she sobbed the kids. And the sobbed Merwala. Oh, so 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 she sobbed the kids at night. In the morning, the woman all she found the kid dead and then blah blah. You know the story they had to go to King Solomon. Now look at the wisdom of Solomon. Now wisdom never but listen to me carefully. Wisdom will never put you in trouble. Because wisdom never backfires. You could ask. What if it never reached that point? Because wisdom never backfires. Solomon says, okay, for now that you're arguing about the kid, soldier, bring a sword, take the kid, cut them in half. The mother who was not the, 
the, the, the, the kid's mom says, yeah, half, half. The mother who is, the kid's mother says, no, don't cut the kid. Rather give her the complete kid. And Solomon just then knows who is the real mother. That's wisdom in, 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 in motion. You see that? And this is where every family leader needs wisdom. This is where every parent needs wisdom. You get the point? The knowledge of how to apply everything and make sound judgment. So it says here the mind which is governed by the flesh. Now, is it possible the mind is the soul? Is it possible for the flesh to dominate the, 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 the soul? Yes. And this is what leads people to sinning. The lusts of the flesh. You see, you think, you see, you desire. You see, you decide. You see, you do. The flesh has dominated the soul. And this is exactly what causes people to end up in hell. When they have yielded themselves, other themselves, in this case, when man yields himself, we mean when the, when the soul yields itself to the flesh. And now you could ask, why have, do we have to be in the flesh? Because the flesh is the license. Yo, one more for some more. The flesh is housing the soul and the image of God. So on earth you need the flesh. You need, the flesh is the suit or the costume rather that we put on to be in this world. As soon as we have to leave this world, we put off the flesh. It goes back to where it comes from. Then the rest happens on the other side. But now the flesh, because it is earthly, the flesh is the closest to the ground. It came from the ground. And there's one Tesali Fatsi. They feel much better than Tesabu Mudim. When you ask people, I've said this some time back, when, I, when you ask a person, when you invite a person to church, or let's go to church, the question they ask you, it's a Ghana command. How about invite her to party, but it's a Ghana command. Get the point? That's the flesh. The flesh does not want to subject itself. As a result, the flesh is the greatest enemy to the soul, to the mind. And that's why everybody who cannot control their flesh, rest assured, they are going to die in the, in the, in the end. They will die. Their spirits are going to, are never, their souls are never going to make it. Because the flesh will always be fighting. So that's why we need to Go and read Galatians, Galatians chapter number 5, the works of the flesh, and be able to subject our flesh. Tell your flesh what to do. Check this out. The hardest thing for you to do is to go to the gym. The easiest is to sit around TV. That's the flesh. Flesh feels much better sitting there on TV, in front of the TV. If you're going to have to beat your body, you need to have the soul that wants to do it, that is determined. Then you can actually... Invite the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, help me in order for me to put down the flesh. Then the Holy Spirit will actually enable you to be able to fight the flesh until your flesh obeys you. Are you okay with that? Then it goes like, but the mind that is governed by the spirit. So you let your mind, your soul, you subject your soul to the governance of the Holy Spirit. You consciously make decisions for the Holy Spirit. I yield my mind. I yield myself. Kind of how in my mind you mean? You mean you mean the soul? And when you say the soul, you mean yourself. Holy Spirit, I yield myself to you. So I should be governed by you. But be be prepared for a, for a, for a marathon when you do that, because He is going to begin to show you too many things that he is not pleased with about you. He might actually even go a little bit further and begin to show you individuals who is not pleased with around you. And this is where a life, that, a life of discipline begins. This is where you find a person who is always surrounded by friends is, can hardly make good decisions. And this is where your parents come in when they say, I don't like this friend of yours. They don't hate, they just don't like. Are you okay? So those are the, some of the things. Now verse number 11 says, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead. Now, 
He is called here the spirit who raises people from the dead. The spirit of resurrection or the spirit of life. So when, when, when your body just feels like, I cannot. You know, you, get, you do get to a point where, where, where you are so heavily laden, even physically. When you are just dying physically, when, when you are attacked by all sorts of diseases and your body is just giving up. What you need is to allow the spirit of life and say, spirit of life, you raised Jesus from the dead. I yield myself to you. But remember, last week I said, two weeks ago, I said, God is not good at dealing with emergencies. Women does not have that red button. So he prefers relationships. God works better where there's a constant relationship than to, be, to have an emergency call. As a matter of fact, there are no emergency lines in heaven. You get the point where you can call Baba Okay. No problem. So you must have you must have a subscription early enough. Walk, 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 walk with God from, from early enough. All right. This is what gave the, the three young men in, in Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the boldness to say what they said. They said, even if we burn. The thing is, we think they knew they were not gonna burn. It's not true. This, when they said, even if we burn, God, they were so convinced about their walk with God that if we burn, no problem. We have nothing to lose. Good moment, that death was just going to become a transition. In any case, death is a transition all the way. But there are positive transitions and negative transitions. So when they said, even if we die, O oh king, they were saying, we have nothing to lose. So what would make you look death in the face and say, I have nothing to lose? Not unless you were a friend, a close friend of the spirit of life, and you knew that death is just but a transition, and you know as well that there shall be resurrection. You see that? It's only a person who understands those things. So no, 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 I die. It's just like I go to sleep. And the, you know, the best part about my funeral, my, my, my death would be, I don't owe anybody anything anymore. And I don't have to care about anything else in this world. And as the Bible says, the dead have no share in this world. It tells you, I read this world. I read the dead have no share in this world. So it, they could have a share somewhere else, but not in this world. So in this world, they are discounted. They are free. They are no longer going to be taking part in anything here. So where are they taking part? We'll, let, we'll, we'll check that out. Are you okay with that? Fine. So what happens... At death. In order for us to remember that, I would like us to quickly trace this Bible back to Genesis chapter number 2. There's a scripture we read there sometime. Genesis chapter number 2, verse number 7. Remember how God created man. Then God took the dust of the earth and he created man. I'm paraphrasing it. And then... There was man, the dust lying there in the form of man, but not alive. Then if you could link to that, you could link John 4, 24, which says, God is spirit. And those that worship must worship in spirit and in truth. But now let's just take it as a God is spirit. So God, the spirit, took dust, made the body of man. And that is why... Today, we don't see you coming into this earth as, board, as, 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 as soil because he said, multiply and fill the earth, etc. So what he said there, he gave men that divine ability to reproduce. So they will no longer have to come as dust. But as soon as there's, the sperm fertilizes the egg and then the creation takes place. And a passing is started. So it, it has become like, a, I'm not even a shortcut. It has become, uh, not, 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 not opposite, yeah, shortcut, long cut. I get about like right now. You know that? But that's, <laughs> yeah, shortcut, long cut. You're right. It's the long cut of the shortcut. It was the shortcut. God made man. 
Now, today we're going the long cut. Why shortcut Maruli? Okay, because boom, within a few minutes, man was up and running. Today, man has to be started somewhere in the womb. And it takes about nine months for them to come out into the earth and say, hello, earth. You say, so get long cut here. So most of, all of us here except Adam, we took a long cut. But now, the same process takes place in the womb. And that is why abortion is sin. As soon as the egg meets the sperm and the fertilization and there's a heartbeat, there's a human being, not a clot. And somebody could say, okay, fine, but Muruti, what, how, how, how does God allow kids to fall pregnant? It's a law. How does God allow a kid to be hit by a bus? It's a law. If, we, if, we, if you are going to put a law, some law into application, if we are going to put a law in action, there shall be results of the same law. It doesn't matter. Anybody who has sex, doesn't matter how old they are, 8 or 80, you, there, there could be a kid. Because it's a law. God gave people the right to multiply and fill the earth. So human beings today are brought by the will of man, somehow, in the flesh, but by the will of God, in the spirit. He put a spiritual law there, which is running 24 hours, and we tap into it through sexual intercourse. You get the point? And that is why uh, there are some churches today on, on, on earth that are so stupid that are saying to couples, you should not use contraceptions as if the church is going to feed the kids. Before sperm meets egg, ahona mo to mo, it's seed and seed. So any church that says to you contraception is of the devil, you must ask the pastor to show you his bad balance and make an affidavit. As you begin to make kids, he's going to support them. We know, we know some of those people who've got sitting with about 17, 18 children, all because these are church children. It's so stupid. Until you start naming them, got a number, John 1 and John 2, John 3, John 4, John 5. That's so stupid. It doesn't please God. It doesn't actually allow these kids to afford them a quality life. Are you okay with that? So, most Genesis chapter number 2 verse, it says, Then God formed God, I wish I could, you could remember this, Then God, John 4, 24, The Spirit formed man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the Spirit. There, the breath of life means the spirit of life. He breathed into man the spirit of life or the breath of life and man did not become a spirit but he became a living soul. I tried to explain this last week. If man was a spirit, spirits don't die and spirits cannot, as soon as the spirit comes into any container, it cannot be controlled by the natural environment. Spirits are superior to natural environment. Therefore, if man was spirit, man would never die because God never dies. God never dies. For Jesus to experience death, he had to come through the long cut. Get into a body and became a living soul while he was God. So this is a mystery that we can argue for the rest of our lives. That how God, how does God become a living soul? How does you know that? But at the end of the day, I'm saying for Jesus to experience death, he had to come through the channel of being born as a man because it is only through being a soul that you are going to experience death. Your body can only contain that soul which is going to be released when you are dying. So you can never die unless you have a body. Demons don't die. When God chased the demons, the Satan and his angels out of heaven, he could have killed them. But why? Because spirits can't die. And that's why in the book of, is it Peter? It says then there are some of those angels which are kept in chains of darkness. So if demons could die or be sent to hell, God would have done so. But, and also, it sort of like also challenges the theory. Yeah, those powerful preachers who send demons to hell and tell them where to go sometimes. It challenges the theory. That's, it cannot happen. You know, casting out the demon. Come out. Go to hell. And never show your ugly face ever here again. Then about it's gone. Over your dead body. Moon. Over your dead body. It cannot happen. We can never. It says, we'll read. It, it, men, men, in, in, is it Psalms 8? 
What is man? Yeah, Psalms 8. What is the son of man that you visit him? What is man that you are so mindful of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. That tells you that little lower than the angels simply tells us man, man has limitations. Man is not spirit. There are limitations. Man can only function as far as the anointing, which is the spirit of God in him, can allow him to go. But even up to this point, man cannot, without the image of God, man can never compete with demonic spirits. What makes demonic spirits to hear us, to listen to us, it is the image of God in us and the name of Jesus. That's why he gave us a name that is above every other name. But we can never compete. One demon can slap you upside down unless you, uh, if, if you are not made in the image of God. Are you okay with that? So, it says, Moho, verse number two, verse number seven, God breathed into his, in, into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Now, reading this scripture and getting the idea that the spirit goes back to God, the question remains, what happens to the soul after we read Ecclesiastes chapter number 12? In Ecclesiastes chapter number 12, it tells us about the death. The, the writer uses quite a lot of poetic language there. I don't want to go through it. I just want to check it, concentrate on the essence of the scripture. It says more verse number one, Ecclesiastes 12, number one. It says, remember your creator in the days of your youth. For those of you who don't want to actually mess up with God while you are young, the Bible says, do start knowing God now. You're not going to know God when you're old. It's much, much better if you start early. Actually, everything in life is much better started early enough. Remember the creator in the days of your youth before the days of trouble come and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Then verse 6, remember him before the silver cord is severed and the golden body. Now these are just poetic languages, a poetic language that describes the soul, the body, and the golden picture being shattered. It gives us separation where this beautiful building that we live in is totally destroyed ultimately. Or then there's going to become a day when there is a separation, when men will reach a point, it's actually speaking about death. Or at death, then there is a separation of everything, all components that ever made men are going to be separated. Everything. You get the point? So it says, remember him therefore, Before the silver cord is severed and the golden ball is broken, before the pitcher is shattered at the spring, wah, 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 and dust returns to the ground. We know this very well. We have attended so many funerals. And I've casually said to people, for you to go to, to fin uh, uh, keep attending funerals and die one day and go to hell, you should consider yourself the most stupid person ever to walk the planet. Because I said, Funerals, Sabbath Bobang, are our rehearsals. If you've ever been to a funeral, you have already attended a rehearsal session or a dress session. You know what's going to happen to you. But people go, they even speak at funerals. They go and they even conduct other people's funerals. They go and they thank people and tell them, go But what happened to you after one day? And you still die, and you fail to reach the destiny of Mumdim. So that's very, that's very stupid. Now it's because people think death is about, they, they think the best way of explaining life after death is to explain it by their concept, their ancestors. Let me be honest with you. When God started this whole thing, there were no ancestors. And the word ancestor is not a word that describes an, 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 a, 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 a person to be worshipped. Ancestor simply means we who came before you. Predecessor. Everybody has got ancestors. Everybody has got predecessors. Ancestor and worship are not synonyms. Ho oh, hang. Do you get the point? When people go and they check what they call their family tree, you're not checking a tree, yeah, the idols. We're checking a tree of those who came before you. But the best way to do this whole thing, just forget about the concentrate on God. 
Because if you're going to follow those things, then you're going to get into the other things, clan names. After the clan names, then you're going to describe, they're going to describe you and begin to prophesy over you through clan names. Nina is in the same full end. That's, that's, you know, that's, so you begin to write those prophecies. There's, there's, there's things said that are going to uh, unleash uh, demonic spirits to come into your life. You get the point? Some, some people cannot stop stealing because uh, they are, they are, they are, they are clan names. Ziti, uza, uza, uza kalen tuwe nga se zaako ufuneza baanyi. Haba mwaba mtagazela bashuwalu. Para aga chabuli suwa eza ke ufuneza baanyi. That's why kuya choncho, kuya choncho, kuya choncho, ngege bae kuchoncho. Bachoncho na se sontuen because baka legi siwe. Ngobagule tuko zabu gune ita legi suwe ee ningi. And that is why we miss God. And that's why the best thing, you know, the side of the Bible says, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, if any Pungani be in Christ, then he's a new creation. He is no longer Pungani, now he's a Christian. Because there is no Jew, no Greek, and no, no Zulu, no Kosa, but everyone comes just to become in Christ, in God. So this is much better that way. Even when your kids ask you, what is it Jesus? Jesus. You see that? Because then that's exactly who we are. In him, we have become new creations. How can God, God go and create you and call you man? And then somebody comes and calls you boy Benyat. That's contradictory. Because now, let me be honest with you. God in the garden, he brought Inyati to man to see what he would call them. So men cannot be identified or given strength by an animal because animals are subject to men. As a matter of fact, men named animals. So animals will become, will remain inferior to men. So men cannot afung ngeilwani because he's superior from sifunga ngunkulunkul. Are you okay? So that's exactly what binds most of you. And then this is where the work of the Holy Spirit comes in. Who reminds you? You were created by God. The spirit of creation. The spirit of life. That your life comes from God. Spirit of resurrection. That when anything dies around you, God can bring it back through the Holy Spirit. So this is not time to call your ancestors. This is time to call unto the Lord, the Creator. It's, it's not complicated. It's straightforward. So we have to cleanse ourselves and come out of this. The Sabbath says, come out of them and be separate. Are you okay? So it says here, and the dust returns to the ground. Remember, you know, if you are going to understand Ecclesiastes 12, you must read it in conjunction with Genesis 2 and other scriptures that we are going to read. But for now, if I join Genesis 2, Ecclesiastes 12, it now begins to, to, to give us an idea. Remember, Genesis 2, uh, 2, it says, Then God formed man out of the dust, and he breathed into man the breath of life, and man became a living soul. More than becoming a living soul, he became flesh. He had a flesh body. God created a dust body. Are you okay with that? Dust body. Breathed into it, it became flesh body. So when man dies, flesh body returns to dust body. It's simple. Not unless, you know, you know, clan, they eat people up. But in any case, I tried to explain the first week how resurrection takes place. When a man is eaten by a lion, and that lion is eaten by the hyenas, the hyenas are eaten by this and that and that, and then and then ultimately God says, somebody rise, then you're going to have to come back somehow. Are you okay with that? So it says here, then the dust returns to the ground where it came from. Then it, the spirit, now next to the spirit, I have again put John chapter number four. Because I will never uh, agree that man is a spirit. Man is a soul. The Bible says so. 
Because if man is a spirit, how then does spirit which cannot, which cannot uh, separate from God? A spirit, samudim, it says the spirit returns to God who gave it. So if man was totally spirit, it means everybody goes back to God when they die. It means that there's nobody who goes to hell. So it means there's no point in us trying to live right because in here we're going to go back to God. That's logic. It's, it's, it's just rational thinking. Now, if you are spirit, and the Bible says, the dust returns to the dust, spirit goes back to God. Because it says, our spirit goes back to God. So the spirit, I said to you, the spirit of God is what gives man the image. It is the image of God. Now, here, here it goes. To, be in the, in, oh, to, to operate on earth, we need a body. To have authority on earth, we need the image of God, which is the spirit. To be able to walk around on earth, we need the soul, which is the engine, yeah, the body. At death, the body goes back to the ground. The spirit goes back to God who gave it. The authority, that, that image that makes you look like God, goes back to God who gave it. But then what happens to the soul? Are you okay? So he speaks about that. He says that the dust returns to the ground, the spirit goes back to God, and he doesn't touch on the destiny of the soul. Why? Because the Bible witnesses, remember I said to you sometime back, I said, the Bible is one book that witnesses for itself. You have to go to this particular page and get the witness for this other page. Go to that chapter, it witnesses for that other one. And this is where the Bible becomes interesting because it even says by itself, it says, at the mouth of two or three witnesses, a matter is established. That's why we have to read this and mix with that. And here, what that one says, it's called progressive revelation. Progressive revelation, like, for an example, when the children of Israel left Egypt, God said, you are going to the promised land. But as they began to walk, God begins to say, take this route, take that route, take that route. This is how it begins to open up. So this is what progressive revelation looks like. Yeah, we know in part... And that's why we prophesy in part. But as we keep on going and going and going and going and going and going, when we begin to realize, okay, fun, from this point where we thought we had arrived, God was just giving us a tea break. So we have to continue and go the other side. And the other side. This is how, what the revelation is all about when it becomes progressive. Are you okay with that? So we have to go to, with this, remember these two scriptures, Genesis 2, 7, and Ecclesiastes 12, 1 to 6. Then let's go to Luke chapter number 16. Luke chapter number 16 tells us about two guys who lived. And Luke chapter number 16 is not a parable. As a par Jesus was not giving a parable. It's not the parable. Yeah, Lazarus. And the rich man. Jesus said there was a certain man. And there was a gentleman called Lazarus. He names them. But I think Jesus was just being cool here. Not to name the guy, the rich man. Because maybe some of his family were in the crowd. He knew the rich man. But he chose to say then there was a rich man. Jesus is not in the ministry of exposing people. He could have said, there was Lazarus, then there was John da Silva. But how, are we going to the, how was he going to reach to the family of John da Silva after he told everybody that John da Silva has gone to hell? So that's why we need to be smart when it comes to preaching the gospel. And that is why anybody who stands and says, there's, a, there's somebody here. Uh, you see that now, how about some, some of the clips on, on, on TV you can tell the devil is all behind this whole thing. There's a woman here with a problem in her womb. Isn't that so, madam? Come, come, come on. Pull, pull up your dress. See? Pull up your dress. And then they keep touching. Jesus would never do that. And that's why even when he healed people, he would say to them, just don't tell anybody, church. Just go. So we can tell where the spirit of God is and where the spirit of God is not. Some people, after they prayed for you and you had piles, when you come with the piles, 
They take a, a selfie of your piles. Then take the selfie of the piles somehow and put it on, on social media. And they say, we healed this person from the piles. And they don't even put that black thing here. Looking this way and then the piles and you. That's not how God works. Yeah, get selfie of the pile. You heard me right. So he says here, there was a certain rich man, but I'm saying he knew the man of the rich man because then he said, at the gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus. But I think, Bobby, and in the crowd, if he was speaking in the vicinity of where these two guys used to live, in the crowd, somebody knew who Jesus was referring to. How did they know? One, there was a rich man who died. So we start finding out which, back then there were no 8 billion people on earth. So they first started searching who's the rich man who died. They found four rich men who died. Then he says, at his gate, there was Lazarus. <laughs> then they go like, okay. See that? So what, what, what's amazing is that he doesn't actually put it there because I said to you, the Bible is a thinking man's book. When God, when you listen, you'll be able to apply or to realize what the Bible is saying. So he speaks and they, some of them knew the person who died and he says to them, yeah, he's gone to hell. And some people can attest to it. They were there. They could tell about his stories. They looked at him and they said, he's so cruel. Some thought he was an angel. But Jesus says, no, surprise, he's gone to hell. Because otherwise, if God does not show us how to get to heaven, how will we go there? If we are, and that's why I said to you last week, there are some of our family members that we know very well. Which is so sad. The saddest part here would be, if you sitting here, you're going to die and meet the person. Now that's being a mumish. Mumish of a lifetime. So at his gate was laid a beggar covered with sores. His name was Lazarus. And longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Let's me, let me skip this and skip that and skip that. It says, Mohum, verse 22. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him into Abraham's side. And these people have been using this scripture for centuries to promote poverty. People think the poorer, the holier. No. Yes. Poverty and trouble and sickness and disease and challenges have a way of drawing us to God. But once we're drawn to God, he rehabilitates us and teaches us how to do things properly. And that is exactly where the challenge lies. That people who come out of poverty would not learn the laws, the prosperity. Therefore, they remain poor until they die. And they think it's holy to be poor. We, we, knew, we grew up in an era where guys were promoting poverty. I mean, I was telling uh, some of the guys about some of my friends we used to go to school with many years ago who were actually promoting everything wrong. They were promoting it's wrong to go to school. Yeah, once you, once you, once you see this one, they did that all the time. I, was, I, told, I told some guys back then, some of the guys who were actually left school, God said to them, walk to Deben and preach. They did. They left school and walked to Deben. And back in Augusta, they were going to go to Deben. So they were going to go to So I'm asking myself, how does God who gave, who gave Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel wisdom would call three men in 2019 and say to them, don't go to school. Because wisdom also can apply on a, a, a mind that is already open. The Bible speaks about the renewal of the mind. Education renews the mind. When you sit there and you know 10 times 10, it renews your mind. It tickles your mind. It, it opens up the valves of your mind. It makes you sharp. You get the point? And that is why one of the worst things that could ever happen to our country, remove, edu remove prayer from schools, remove the Holy Spirit from schools, then you've got mind that, minds that are blocked. And that's, that's the challenge we're sitting with today. And that's why we need, we need to really to trust God for Christian schools. 
So, the rich man also died and he was buried. It says in hell where he was in torment. Now, after you've read Ecclesiastes 12, first after you've read Genesis 2, which says man became a living soul, and you read Ecclesiastes 12, which tells you that the body goes back to the dust and the spirit goes back to God. Now, it's easy to come to a conclusion. Who actually goes to hell? It's Some people like that. But can I covering? So after you read, the man became a living soul. And Ecclesiastes says, when he dies, the dust from which he was taken goes back to the dust, the body. And he says the spirit, the image of God goes back to God who gave it. So it lives. You don't, you don't have to be intelligent to come to a conclusion. Yeah, who went to hell? Because the spirit went back to God who gave it. The dust went back to the ground. So what happens to the soul? So who is, who is the person that is crying out in hell? The soul. It's easy. Not unless you want to argue. And look at what arguing was telling to Oksalayo. Remember how to win an argument? Once you win an argument, you want to win an argument, it isn't Oksalayo, Oksalayo, Oksalayo. That's how you win. So it says here, um, in hell where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away. Now, how, how, how sad it is. The saddest thing about death. Okay, it's a two, two-sided coin. The good thing and the saddest thing is that your, 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 the education or the memory of your soul is never taken away. Because then how would you be judged unless you can remember what you've done? How can anyone call you and judge you about things that you cannot even recall? So the soul is like the black box of a human being. The soul keeps data. Yeah, everything on earth. The soul in the book of Corinthians said, we are going to give account of everything we've done. It's so sad. Because you will remember everything you've done. Because this man dies, he looks, he can recognize Abraham, he can recognize Lazarus. Now the challenge with rich people is this one. They think gonna, they could continue to be rich beyond death. He looks at, at Abraham, they begin to have a conversation. Then for the first time he realizes, or, ah, how can a desperate person like Lazarus have gone that far? He says to, the, to, to, Lazar, to, to Abraham, send Lazarus. I'm going to say I'm going to say I'm going to say I'm going to say I'm going to Then he forgets or no, this time, Lazarus is sitting in the VVIP section. He can't send Lazarus this time. Lazarus is a very important person. But then he has other concerns. He can remember that he has got five brothers on earth. That's so sad. That he is intact. Even though the body has gone to the ground and the spirit has gone back to God, the soul is intact. It remembers details, everything. Just imagine. That's the sad thing about it. I would rather be intact like that in glory. I would rather like be in heaven and remember, Hori, I've left people on earth. May they please make it to heaven. Then try to become a preacher of salvation in hell. And this is not only a rich man's problem. This is, in, the, the, there are people on earth who are infatuated by too many things. You could be infatuated by a number of things that could make you miss the mark. Yeah, 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 the reality of why you are here. Business people, people who have things, too many people have the tendency. And these are, these are the things, these are the works of the flesh. This is how the, 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 the flesh dominates the, the soul. When a person experiences success, 
they do not know when to stop. People, should, people will go on. A man who's never worked all his life, or a young man, a young woman, who's never worked all his life, and they get a job ultimately, they cannot even realize, Hore, the overtime yes, Sunday is a snare. Then in the name of hustling and making up for lost time, they become like the rich men. Not realizing one thing, the, the, up, up, your absence from the presence of God simply means absence from the spirit of God. The Bible says, do not forsake the coming together of the saints. And when we talk about church, we don't talk about reading the scriptures only. We talk about fellowship with the brethren. There is something amongst the brethren. You get the point? We're grooming each other. And that's why you can never have church in your home. You can't say no. Same time as a guy. That's deception. Sooner or later, you're going to turn as a guy for five minutes, turn as a guy for three minutes, turn as a guy two minutes, turn as a guy one minute per week. Next thing, turn as a no more. Then as soon as you do that, there's something called soul decay. I call it soul. I don't know call it spiritual decay because the spirit cannot ever be decayed. The spirit goes back to God. I call it soul decay. Soul decay is when the spirit begins now to wrestle, to, to, to rest in failure. In the absence of God, then the spirit just begins to see and that's it. And the next thing you know, boom, dead. Okay, but but we are going to like this. This is going to happen. But I'm going to suck for How many people have we buried there for? From this church who've gone to hell? I don't believe that everybody we buried here has gone to heaven. That's a, that's a lie. Some I knew. Some I knew in Jagai Tule Langati. As Tubegen was alone. But I know. Okay, I see you again. So this scripture here shows us that man continues to live after death. Not in the grave, but in heaven or hell. Okay, while we're here, how, how can we make sure that when you die, you don't go to hell? Fine, it's easy. What brought you here? What made you hook up with Jesus? Stop doing that. You won't go to hell. What made us come here and make us subject to salvation was sin. Am I right? And the Bible says all unrighteousness should be considered as sin. And the Bible does actually, like in the book of Galatians 5, it gives us a whole catalog. Exodus chapter number 20 gives us a whole catalog. Many scriptures just tell us on how we can live free from sin. Look at those scriptures, know them, make them a mirror, look yourself into the scriptures, Tick, 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 tick. Whatever you find wrong that would qualify you to be a sinner, don't do it. And that's why Jesus would say, after they caught the woman uh, in the very act of adultery, Jesus said, go and sin no more. That's what. So you live a clean life. You live a holy life. You live for God. I hope try you won't make mistakes, but I doubt if adultery is a mistake. It's too premeditated. I used to be a policeman. One of some crimes that are in there premeditated. And that is, that is exactly what courts want to prove in Jalawood. No, we shall see the value of the because But you can't just wake up in the morning and find yourself pants dropped, wrong bedroom, wrong woman, icon. This was premeditated. 
See that? So you must, once your, your conscience is alive, once your, 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 the, the, inside the soul there's something called the conscience, the conscience is that scratchy feeling that says, no, no, stop, stop. What, what if, what if, what if? Then you go like, shut up. Remember when, when Sylvester was always Sylvester after, after granny leaves and it was only Sylvester and Tweety. How Sylvester comes to, to the cage about Oja Tweety and the Tweety are, but granny said, then Sylvester says, shut up! About Queen Tweety. And nonetheless, then granny comes, puts them on, on the x-ray, Tweety markets like Mara Sylvester. Then granny pumps Sylvester on the buttock, then Tweety comes out. God is not going to do that. He's not going to spank you and let you and let the sin come out and, and take you. Sin takes you to its destiny. I now wonder what would have happened, Pastor Krish, if, according to the book of Revelation, is it seven where it describes war in heaven? What would have happened if immediately Satan repented? Chances are he would have been forgiven. How do we know? Because God has forgiven most of us. God is a forgiving God. So it means the devil walked out without repenting. Kind of repentance it simply means retrace your steps. Be remorseful of what you did. Subject yourself to God's judgment and say, I'm sorry. And God, because he's a forgiving God, had the devil just asked for forgiveness, there would be no church. That idiot. God is a forgiving God. I'm simply applying my mind. I'm just saying, what if he said to God, forgive me? But now, uh, pride. The Southern Bible says, pride becomes before a fall, and the spirit of haughtiness comes before destruction. And Isaiah chapter 14, it says, because of your pride, you are, he fell before he even fell. He allowed his conscience to not be alive, made alive, you know, to, to, to fear God for some reason. Are you okay? So let's go to Psalms chapter number 16. We're almost there. In Psalm 16, verse number 7, it says, I will bless the Lord or bless Jehovah who has given me wisdom. My heart also instructs me in the night. I have set God or I have set Jehovah always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory, my glory rejoices. My flesh also shall rest in hope. Now he's touching again that heart, he had a flesh, he had a dust. My flesh shall rest in hope. Why flesh rest in hope? Because on the resurrection, the Bible says then in the book of uh, Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 4, it says the dead in Christ shall rise First, not that the dead in Christ will be in the grave, but their flesh will be in the grave. So, Harim, my flesh shall rest in hope. Uri, I know I shall be resurrected. Hope, sins, hope simply means I shall be resurrected not to eternal judgment, but to eternal life. I know I shall wake up one day. My flesh, God help me that my flesh should rest in hope. Knowing what on the day of the resurrection, I shall rise to eternal glory, not eternal judgment. That's what it means, Yahari. My flesh shall rest in hope. Because how would a boy, how, I don't think the people who are in hell, uh, if they could make decisions, they would wish for the resurrection. Because if you check how, the, if you read the book of Revelation about the resurrection and the types of punishment, what they are going through now is nothing. Basically. So they would never hope for a resurrection. They would rather settle for what they have. Anybody who would hope for a resurrection would be somebody who's hoping for a better life after death. Are you still around? Come on, let us send the Lord. I hope I'm making sense to you. So it says here, my flesh also shall rest in hope. For you will not do what? For you will not leave my soul in hell. Now he tells you why he says, I'm hopeful. Since my soul won't be in hell, my resurrection will be hopeful. I will be rising here. 
And my, well, ultimately, when I meet that body, which is going to become a glorified body. You get the point? 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 says what? We, we saw our body incorruptible. When it rises, it's going to rise incorruptible, which simply means when ultimately we rise back from the dead, our bodies will be glorified and in heaven, boom, we meet again with our souls and we live in one body again. As, 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 as a complete person in the glory of God, having been given robes of white to live in the presence of God. For, and that is why, check, in heaven we're all going to wear the same uniform. And that's why I'm only fasting, you must choose your own color while you can. And don't let anybody condemn me about the color. I'm going to I'm going to That would be nice, eh? So, it, it, it says here, for you will not leave my soul in hell. You will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. He's referring back to the body. Or corruption means damnation. You're not going to allow me to be condemned altogether. I will rise and see God one day. This is the work of the spirit of resurrection. The spirit which brings people back to life. The spirit which comes and makes you to become alive again in Christ. Then more Revelation chapter number 6. In Revelation chapter number 6, it confirms the theory that the soul is the one that goes to hell or to heaven. Psalms, he says, my soul is not going to go to hell. Revelation chapter number 6 says there were souls in heaven, not spirits. Because the image of God, the spirit, has already gone back to God who gave it. Verse number 9, Revelation 6. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who have been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. Then each of them was given a white robe and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters were killed just as they had been slain. My point key, verse number six. Under this altar, there were the souls of those who have been slain. So it is the soul of man which goes either to heaven or goes to hell. The body goes back to the grave. The spirit, which is the image of God, goes back to God who gave it. Could not possible. Or by the time a person gasps, that is not the soul living. That's the image of God living. I'm just using, applying, come on. I'm imagining. The gasp, gone. That's what goes back. I imagine that's a soul. That, that, that's the spirit of God going back to God, to God. And the soul takes the other way around. I agree, hell, we know, or hell is waiting for people. The Bible speaks about hell being in the belly of the earth. A person is lying down there, they're dying. They just ride down, ride down. Somewhere in the belly of the earth, in the middle of the earth, scientists have proven there's fire there. That could be hell. The people who have actually gone there, unfortunately, the rich man said, Moho, Jesu, Ari, if somebody comes back from the dead and, and tells them they might be saved, Jesus says, no, they should actually listen to those people on earth. So what is the actual size of the human soul? How is this going to help you to know the message of the Holy Spirit? To understand how vast your soul is will actually help you in understanding how you could be occupied by both profitable and unprofitable things. One of the terms we used to use when people were just all over, the multitaskers, nearly binds into a ning, but could this into a in this cause. Remember that? But I would in Turkey, was a scot or some cousin, the river was now. Okahon or Rakari Sim Kadogam cousin, Jonunch. Baba Rike on spot. To 
give you the idea, an idea about the size of the human soul. Look at the aeroplane, how it operates, look at its size, look at the speed of it. It came from the soul of man. To give you an idea of the size of the soul of man. Look at the train. Look at the space shuttle. It came from the soul of man. To give an idea of the spirit of God. Look at the universe. The earth. The sea. The sun. The moon. The stars. All the planets. Look at all land and sea animals including all the insects. And the Bible says he knows them all. That gives an idea of the spirit of God. He breathed that into man and gave man a living soul. It became a living soul. Living soul produces aeroplanes, trains, guns, microphones, speakers, light, heaters, clothes, carpets, everything, houses, trains, guns, you name it. That's the size of the soul of man. But what is the actual size of the soul of man? Since all these things come from man. Man puts a building that he can never climb. He creates scaffolding. So he can get onto the scaffolding, create the building. Then later on, he is stranded on ground floor and he wants to go to 200 level. He can't reach when the leaves are out. That's the size of the soul of man. Man is that big. No wonder the following scriptures frighten. Matthew chapter number 12. In Matthew chapter number 12, verse 43, it says, when an pure spirit comes out of a person, oh Lord, person is soul. But it says, when an impure spirit goes in there, it can find room. It talks about an evil spirit. But an evil spirit can come in, squeeze itself in there, and find enough room. Now what happens then to Psalms chapter number 8. God what is man that you are so mindful of him. You have made him a little lower than the angels. Angels doesn't mean only celestial beings that are holy. Demons are fallen angels. So man being a little lower than the angels. But can be occupied at the same time by eight of them. Now let's just tell you the side of the soul of man. Tiny as you are, you are bigger than the dome in your soul. There could be so much in you. And this is where you find that people are not aware of the actual size of their soul. And they are concentrating on shutting only one door or concentrating on one door only. While leaving every other door. Back then when we did deliverance, I used to explain it in this fashion. I used to speak and say, the soul of man is like the biggest hotel you can ever find. With different rooms. And it's never full. It can occupy and occupy and occupy and occupy and occupy. Infinitely so. Now imagine, worry on its own, mommy girl, worry on its own is so painful to the soul. One, when worry comes in and just occupies one room, there your soul, imagine, doubt comes in, lives in another room. Resentment finds a room. Bitterness finds a room. Slender, gossip, finds rooms, finds rooms. So when, if we could, we could open men and see in, in the spirit and see what is inside men. People are loaded. Now the Holy Spirit wants to do one thing. He wants to book all the rooms in your life. Every room. Could you, then you put a board right somewhere outside and say, fully booked. Then one worry wants to knock 
You say, sorry, worry. The spirit of peace already lives here. The only room I could allow you was the room, Yawari, but it's occupied by the spirit of peace. Then when he says, are you sure about that? He says, yes, I'm sure. We're in a spirit of unbelief because the spirit of faith is already in that room. I can't allow you to come and question because should you, you come and question, then you're going to end up evicting peace. And that's going to be worry. Because I'm, I'm this vast, big, big, big hotel. And God wants to occupy me. Now I know, guy who pulled a Revelation 3.20. <laughs> I'm standing at the door of your heart and I'm knocking. Open up. I will come in. Now if it's Jesus himself coming, well, Jesus is God. God has no size. He fills the universe. Now imagine if the soul of man is occupied by somebody who fills the universe. It gives you another idea of how big you may be so tiny in the natural, but how big your spirit is. And how you could from today go home and begin to draw a list of the occupants. A list of the occupants. What dominates me the most? Because nothing is going to dominate you from the outside. They are going to dominate you from a place of residence because anything on your outside. Look, if you go out there and you are maybe in mountain hiking or you're just working in the field and you've got blackjacks on you, they don't make you worry. Because why? They are outside. Until you receive a missed call and you have you are due for an interview and somebody never left a message that doesn't hang out outside like blackjacks it goes inside there and says they called and you're not gonna get a job oh yes i am gonna get the job because you know what my god said that the earth belongs to him and the fullness thereof therefore we're now worry in the name of jesus ha 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 too late their room was taken by faith your room was taken by sound mind. Your room was taken by rest in the Lord. Your room was taken by the spirit of confidence. Now that's the size of the human spirit. So it says that when an evil spirit comes out of a man, it goes through every dry place in seeking a place and it does not find it. Then it says I will return to the house. Now that explains now. Hore. In the realm of the spirit, Emmanuel, when I was looking at yourself, the unseen world looks at you and they look beyond you and they see a house. They see a place where they could come in and live and you're walking around and you're carrying just more. Your body is carrying just more than your soul. It's carrying the image of God. And now how, does they, how, how can they two occupy the same room? Because man is a free moral agent. God will allow you to choose. But the, the statement says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God has given you and he cannot revoke. Once God has given you his image, he can't revoke it. He's going to call it back the day you die. And that's exactly when separation is going to take place. For some people, by the time they die, the image of God says, I shall rest at last. Because that soul really just did things. I was just like, as an image, I was just like embarrassed to be identified with such a soul. Because I was the image of God in them, but their soul was occupied by every filthy thing. Remember those pictures when we grew? Someone would think, so that heart which had the frogs and dogs and everything and snakes and everything and everything and everything and everything. And, everything. and there was a heart next to it, which was like clean, had the doves and some shining light in it. So it says here, it says I will return to the house that I've left. When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied. So how unoccupied? Because we thought, Ronahore, the spirit of God is what we are. And the spirit of God does not occupy the soul. The spirit of God lives in its own, what we call, I think, what we call the heart. If you believe in your heart. So the spirit of God is the, what, what, the part we refer to as the, not the pumping organ because it's highly, it finds him unoccupied. Where would the spirit of God live if he was living in your soul? The spirit doesn't live in your soul. The soul is you. The soul is the, the, the person who allows other spirits to come in. The spirit of God gives that image. He lives somewhere in man. I choose to say he's the heart. 
with the, we call him the heart of hearts the, where the decisions are made where, where, where boldness where everything where, where God speaks to where revelation comes where everything where, where the Holy Spirit comes and reinforces and, and gives him the same life that he gave to Jesus that's just my theory I cannot I can't, I can't be right about it though I'm just you are playing my mind here it's tough when you don't actually have scripture to support it I wonder that but now it says when it arrives it finds the house clean unoccupied and put in order then it goes and takes with its seven other spirits more wicked than itself and they go and live there now here's one man there was one spirit it lives goes gets other six seven spirits then there's eight spirits in men and now what happens if this man still goes to church no problem demons don't mind going to church Otherwise, there would not be gossips at church if demons minded coming to church. There would not be dissensions in church. There would not be somebody grabbing somebody's handbag or, or wallet, kind of intercession, who's saying, demons don't mind going to church. They do go to church. Because anyhow, in the book of, is it in the book of Timothy? Paul said to Timothy, people are going to abandon the truth and follow deceiving spirits and end up listening to doctrines that are taught by demons so where would demons teach doctrines in the tavern no in church so they would subject themselves to to the to the beating of the word these are the these, these are people are, are, are beings that as we speak they keep saying no he's lying he's lying it cannot be true he's lying because they have come to church and they would never allow me to encourage you to evict them so they'll keep saying, Ongam lale, luna mang, I shangan lento ya kill, shalun jalu. So they come and he's totally occupied. Now, this time, not by one, but by eight spirits. As if it was bad. Let's go to Mark chapter number five, the last scripture, then we go home. As if it was bad enough. No, we haven't seen anything as yet. Eight demons. No, I see next. You are much bigger than that. Ghana, the spirit of man is not a 16 seater or 32 seater or 60 seater luxury bus or, or 500 seater uh, air bus. It's not. It's bigger than that. Good, the spirit of man can take everybody in the air bus if they were spirits and occupy them and still have room. It says more of Mark chapter number 5 verse 1. They went across the lake to the region of Gerasens. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit. And remember some time back, I have emphasized something I called sober moments. I said to you, nobody is mad 24 hours. If a person is mad 24 hours, demons don't eat Demons don't sleep. Demons don't pee. Demons don't do number two. It's the man who does. And the man doesn't do it in, tra in transit. He pauses, he stops. He goes to the loo. So which means it's a sober moment. Say sober moment. It's going to help you a lot to understand sober moment. A sober moment is that moment when your spirit, your, your soul is fighting for freedom and you are aware that you can be sober. You are aware of that, the fact that you can be free from this spirit. Nobody is mad to you. It is the body that wants water and the soul stops to get water. It's a sober moment. That's, those are great graces. I would call them graces that happens to all of us. Where you sit there, that's exactly how the Holy Spirit takes advantage of a sober moment and then boom, he brings conviction. Conviction comes during a sober moment, when for some time, the noise that's in your head, there's noise that is somewhere in your soul, demonic spirit are, are making it, when it's suppressed, when the soul of man wants freedom, that tells you now, in the book of Mark, it says, a man with an unclean spirit ran to Jesus. Demons would never run to Jesus, knowing very well who is their enemy. So this was man running, taking the whole, the whole host to Jesus. 
it was a sober moment and that is why as soon as you find that you need help you must run to jesus and that is why the bible says he who hides his sin and he who confesses it you see the point they both have sober moments the one hides it the one confesses it so what do we do we confess our sins we have we take advantage of that faith out now for a second I became sober. I see my wrong. It's the, it's an opportunity to evict the demonic spirit. And some demonic spirits because of Ephesians chapter number 6, different levels of spirit. Some demonic spirits you chase one, it goes with the whole crowd. Akira okay, spirit went out. They are my house. Then said to the guys, "Then I did the plague that are no errors were along." They cannot conclude. Now who is the leading spirit? The spirit that invited the others. In the realm of the spirit there's something called order. First the law of first things. The the spirit that caught you first has rise to call you my house. So if it invites the other spirit because there's something called order in the realm of the spirit they will know exactly they are subject to this one because it's the one who called. Kimo ba sa running fella most nang order thing. So once you do that you find out you identify your problems why am i so bitter why am i so bitter identify the problem it's a sober moment then go to the cause and say the cause of my bitterness and my discouragement was this 1 2 3 do i need to forgive yes do i need to release somebody yes do i need to bless and not to curse yes therefore i forgive i release i bless Boom! Trouble in paradise, I'm a demon. You're in your soul, no more room. They have to go. Now you are clean, swept, but then you must be occupied. And that's why people who attend deliverance sessions are no longer, are, 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 are never free. Because we deliver them, but we never occupy them. But Puma, but I'm going to get them out there, but I'm going to get them out there, but I'm going to get them out there. They don't go to church. They don't do anything better. And after five months, that spirit says, I'll go back to my house. Then finds them swept, clean, unkept, unoccupied. Then it says, I'll go get seven other spirits. Now the problem is here, Tebuko. The first spirit is one. Second time around, it's eight. We cast out eight. And now there's something called reinforcement. You know that the safety in numbers if we cast out one spirit and it goes back and you are unoccupied it brings seven others you've got eight if we cast out eight and they have to go and bring seven each that's about 64 something like that that it becomes worse so because there's room in you they get cast out they keep reinforcing they get cast out they keep reinforcing. so a man could be sitting with a million demonic spirits in him how do you explain the cases of Charles Manson How do you explain the cases of Hitler? How do you explain the cases of Shaga? These people are demonized. And don't look at me like that. How muzulu umukraste? Your king is Jesus, wena. So this man had a sober moment. He saw Jesus. His spirit took immediate up opportunity he otherwise if the demons were totally in charge at that moment the men would have hidden they would have, the demons would have influenced the men to hide behind and just lie low and until Jesus is gone but he had a sober moment he took advantage so even up to that point when man is possessed he still has the authority through the name of Jesus and the spirit which is the image of God in man he has authority to stand up and say i want my freedom and if you want it enough today could be a day of freedom not in this church right in your home where you would go take a list paper list everything that bothers you check if you have to let it go let it go tell it tell it there is a, an opposite to every law see that I'm tired in jail. I'm going to ask the spirit of refreshing to come into my life. I've lost hope. I'm going to call the spirit of hope. 
I'm confused. I'm going to call the spirit of a sound mind. I'm afraid. I'm going to call the spirit of a sound mind. I'm no longer afraid. I'm going to call. God has not given me the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Then I'm going to wake up there and say, now fear, you go. Power, love, sound mind, come into my life. I'm going to refuse. I, I, I'm angry. I'm disappointed because I accepted offense. I'm going to open up the door and say, spirit of offense, you go. Spirit, spirit, sa, 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 peace, come into my life. Then that's how you do your own deliverance. It's called self-deliverance. That way you are being cleaned up and immediately occupying. This is not what they do when they deliver people. They just say, come out in Jesus' name. And then they are excited. The person is running around. Some demons don't want trouble. They just come out. They saw and that's why next week, guess who's back? I, we have done these things. We took 30 minutes for deliverance at the first person. Next week, it's another three hours. Some five, five months down the line, we don't want to see the person in the queue anymore. I can't do anything out. Because we failed to occupy them, to give them something to do. Being occupied means having something to do, which is contrary to what the demonic spirit made you to do. Which means after you've been delivered, you now yield yourself to serving the Lord. And that is why most people can never sustain the little things God does. They come to church, they can't have a job, they can't have anything. Then they get to buy a, a, a small car. Then they take the car, buy a sakokai. Emma Plazini, Abo Koko Bayo Kuma, Isin to Gulemot, Esna Tangan in the two to two non Kulun Kul, and that is the downfall of everything. There is a competition between God and demonic spirits, and God can never compete with men. Are you okay? Let me read the last line, then we go home. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but we know the reason why. Such power does not come from man. Man has limited power. That's why Jesus said, but you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Because it's the spiritual realm that gives the spirit, the, the soul of man and the body of man power. That's why Caleb said, Ari, when Moses promised me some 40 plus years ago, 45 years ago, Ari, I am strong as I was back then. He was endured with the spirit of life. And that is why everybody who serves God, everybody who feels like, Mudima, I still have to serve you. I still have to do things. I still have a desire to work with you. Should actually yield their body to God and say, fill me with power so I should be able to run and 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 compete with the younger generation running in the things of the Lord. That I should not die but expire one morning. So, we know who ran to Jesus. Not the demons, but the man. He had a sober moment, Mom Grace. That one moment when you decide, give it all to the Lord. Throw it out. When you decide, when you open up the door of your soul, call the spirits. They are just fallen angels. We name them after the manifestation. Spirits are depression. Boom. But then how do you replace? After you didn't say that, you go into the word of the Lord and say, Holy Spirit, occupy me with peace, joy, every, all the opposite. There's, a, there's an opposite to every situation you're facing. You can go through trials and tribulations and never be bitter. Only challenge and never be bitter at all. This is, what, this is what has made people to go, this is what has made victims to go and forgive perpetrators. A victim, I, Aria, Angsa kunu hamba nginga ya kumar nga kolel. I assume I think I release you, I bless you. You go like he's crazy. No, he's in charge. He has allowed God to minister to him. The story 
goes like more verse 6 when he saw jesus from a distance he ran and fell on his knees in front of him he shouted at the top of his voice now we know very well he referring to the body but we know whoever shouted this statement cannot be the same man who ran to jesus whoever seeing the whoever is saying the next line cannot run to jesus and say the next line it's not the same person so hire he people the writer was saying the voice came from the man but this time it was not the the words of the man the voice was the voice of the man but the words were not the words of the man because obviously if this this man went like jesus son of god that's going to be evident then the writer would have said then the demonic spirit spoke but he screamed using the voice of man so be careful when you listen to people who is talking you will never make it hell no i bind that in jesus name never i will make it because it won't be you will never make it it's going to be when you are just a failure i am not no we point from the against us shall prosper every tongue that rises up against us we will be able to condemn hi man goes He shouted at the top of his voice, "What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name don't torture me." This could not be the man. You can't volunteer run to a person and say, "Don't torture me." The first thing if you're not interested, if you don't want torture, you don't expose yourself. Never. O ka si o ubone botsotsi, uboya ko bona, ubone nga nkhuthuzi, but ufunani kanti. Ufunani la. Bisinga boni tina. Hey, what's what's the Emma Mo? Nuna kutuz. Aye. You dear mekar somehow. You cannot. It's not the 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 voice was the voice of men, but the words were the words of the spirit which were occupying his soul. Hmm. For Jesus had said to him. To this he said to him come out of this man for jesus has said to him come out of this man you impure spirit aha now we know then jesus asked him what is your name he never said my name is lazarus or my name is the rich man my name, my name is legion he replied for we are many he's speaking from man he says you've heard about eight you haven't seen anything this time this one how to mo to see so loaded how about all loaded who no shun that all but i can tell you got 2019 there are people by us and this man even kindergarten stuff my name is legion for we are many and he begged jesus again and again not to send them out of the area a large head of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside the demons begged jesus send us among the pigs allow us to go into them he gave them the permission and that's why we don't eat bacon but now we will be praying for it. We cast out the demons. Somebody said, if you can't eat bacon, then don't drink water as well. Because after they were demonized, they ran into the water. No, I drink still water. Okay, I eat prayed for bacon. <laughs> What's said is the, the statement, uh, the last line here, yeah, verse 13. The herd of pigs, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. And the Bible does not say each demon occupied its own pig. I should want. So we can't say there were 2,000 demons. If demons could squeeze squeeze into one soul what would stop them from squeezing into 2,000 pigs so there were no 2,000 demons there could have been 2,000 there could have been two and a half there could have been 10 there could have been 20 there could have been a million but all that my story here is to show you how vast your soul is shall we stand <clears throat> Come
Come on, send the Lord. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Praise.